First reported in Wuhan, China, on December the 31st, 2019, the coronavirus is impacting our world. Through sickness, through death, through quarantine, through the global markets, through international travel, it is truly impacting the world. And we're all asking the same question. How much is fact? How much is fiction? And how do I prepare for what may be coming? The Surgeon General emphasized that we will know a lot more in a week or two on how this will play out. And in some places, large public gatherings such as church services may have to be restricted March the 4th, 2020. And so here we are today following the declaration of a state of emergency by President Trump, by Governor Abbott, by Jefferson County Judge Jeff Brannick. So today, you notice that our sanctuary is empty and that we come to you with live streaming. In response to these declarations, we want to protect the people of our church and the people of Southeast Texas. So this is a decision that we had to make. I understand there are people that are asking the question, where is your faith? My faith is rock solid on Christ and Christ alone. I stand strong today in my faith. But I also know that times like this demand wisdom and that as a leader in this community, I have a responsibility to set an example for others. Just like we have faith, but yet we still use our seatbelts. We have faith, and yet you still have health insurance. We have faith, and yet we still lock our doors at night. So we strike a balance between faith and being foolish. We understand that our faith is strong, and we have our hope in him. But let us be leaders in the community. And if anyone should lead, it should be the church. And so here we are today. We understand that first reported in Wuhan, China on December the 31st, 2019, the virus COVID-19 is impacting our world. It's ranging from our health and our quality of living to the global markets. Although coronaviruses are actually common throughout the world and generally cause mild illnesses like the common cold, this COVID-19 is a clear and present danger. The point is, we have to deal with fact and fiction. Is this a legitimate concern? Is this an exaggeration? Is there a lot of hype? Is it possible that there's a combination of both? And that I do believe. Although I may question what is fact and what is fiction, one thing I am certain of, the coronavirus perception is creating its own reality. Thus, we see the up and down with the stock market. Luke chapter 21 and verse 26, Jesus said, men's hearts are failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And truly, we're going through a shaking. So today's questions, what are the facts concerning the coronavirus? What are the most recent numbers concerning the outbreak? What measures should be taken to protect our families and ourselves and others? So today we have seated a panelist and I want to introduce them to you and we're so honored to have them, and I'm excited about this moment because I do believe, as I mentioned earlier, that this is going to be educational and informative. First of all, from the Beaumont Public Health Department, we have Director Sherry Ulmer. From the Beaumont Emergency Management, we have the Coordinator, Tim Oknacek. From Beaumont Independent School District, we have Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Anita Frank. From Beaumont Psychiatric Clinic, we have Dr. Jason Mensa. And then from Raymond James Financial Advisor, we have Joshua Cavett, who's running late. He's at his church this morning doing a live stream, and he will be with us here in just a moment. But I welcome them, and I do appreciate this uh, panel and their particip participation in this moment. So let us get started. 
As I mentioned, thank you so much for being here today. I know that you have churches, you have family that you need to be with, but you've taken time to join us and we do welcome you. We have eight questions today that we would like to go through. We'll go through them as quickly as we can because we have so much information we want to cover. And the fact is, is that once we get through with this, we've only begun to scratch the surface of all that's happening out there. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I know that the situation is so fluid. And we are even now trying to wrap our minds around what's happening. This strain, the COVID-19, is truly new for us. Coronavirus, as I understand, has been around for a while. But this is a new strain of it that we have to deal with. And so we know that we're still trying to understand. But we want to give out the best information we can today. So uh, also to those that are watching online, uh, let me encourage you that if you are watching on Facebook that you can, uh, you can uh, post a question and we'll get to your questions the best we can. So those of you that are watching online through Facebook, you can post a question. Okay, so let's get started. Number one, what is the coronavirus and what are its symptoms? And I'll direct this first to Beaumont Public Health Department, Sherry. Good morning. So the coronavirus is a set, uh, actually a group of viruses that typically cause mild symptoms like a common cold. This particular strain of coronavirus started in Wuhan province uh, in China uh, the, sometime in December. We understand that the virus transmitted from animals to humans. The virus has maintained consistent transmission from human to human worldwide. It's in six continents now. And so that's why the World Health Organization has deemed it a pandemic. There has been consistent transmission human to human worldwide. So that's what we're dealing with now. Um, it is the symptoms of coronavirus are um, cough, fever, um, and difficulty breathing. Now we have to remember that we are in flu season and those are some of the same symptoms of the flu. We're also in allergy season and those are some of the same symptoms of the allergies. So what we have been doing as far as attempting to test people with these symptoms, we determine whether or not they have traveled. We determine if they have not traveled, have they been around someone who has been diagnosed or confirmed a confirmed diagnosis of coronavirus? And then we work with healthcare providers and we work with the state to have them testing. So I do want people to know that testing for the coronavirus is available. It may not be available, anyone cannot just get tested, but if it is if it if it seems necessary or if the person experiencing the symptoms, um, if they meet the criteria for testing, we can get them tested. We also work with healthcare providers, however, to first test these people for the flu if they're experiencing symptoms, so we can rule that out. Sometimes they have to be tested for strep throat so that we can rule that out. So if all of those things are ruled out and they meet the criteria, then we look at testing them for coronavirus. And so we know that right now there's a lot of uh, anxiety because people, as you mentioned, are fighting allergies and the flu and common cold. And, of course, right now our minds have a tendency to go to worst-case scenario. And if you get a little fever, you think immediately you have the coronavirus. And so we need everyone just to, just to, to, be, to be calm and, and to understand that if you're overly concerned, that if you show these symptoms, you can contact your doctor and you can be tested, but it needs to be by the orders of a doctor, correct? That's absolutely right. If you are starting to have serious symptoms like difficulty breathing, typically, you know, with the allergies, we're not going to have problems breathing. We're going to be stuffy. Even with flu, we're going to be extremely tired, maybe some shortness of breath. But if you start to experience some difficulty breathing, please call your health care provider or call 
your local hospital emergency room. We want you to get help as quickly as possible. And um, we will then, the health care providers and hospitals will then contact us at the health department. We will work with the state in getting that test approved. And certainly we advocate on the side of safety for the patient. And we certainly will advocate to get that test approved. So far, we have no confirmed cases of coronavirus in Beaumont or in Jefferson County. And we, we have sent tests to, uh, have sent specimens to be tested. All of them have come back negative. I know that people are asking the question, why don't we just test everybody? But uh, one thing is there's not enough test uh, packets out there at this point. The government is ramping that up and that is changing daily. But the other reason is, is we don't want to overwhelm the medical system. Is that correct? That is absolutely right. If you're healthy and well, there's no need to be tested. It's like if you're not experiencing flu symptoms, why, do you, why would we test you for the flu? That is overwhelming and it is an unnecessary use of, um, of those supplies, which are already limited. So like you said, we, we are hearing that those supplies are going to be ramping up pretty soon and we don't know what that's going to look like, but as soon as we do, we certainly will keep the public aware. Sherry, there's been a lot of talk about, well, why are we reacting this way to the coronavirus? Uh, we've had the flu around for years. Uh, can you talk just a little bit about the difference between this particular strain of the coronaviruses and the common, the common flu and common cold? So, you know, I, I don't want to downplay the flu because um, with both of these of viruses, we are concerned about our elderly population and our people who are living with compromised immune systems. We, we have people who are on cancer treatments. Um, so both of these viruses can be dangerous for those populations. We are, um, we are fortunate that we have a vaccine for the flu. We've dealt with the flu for years, so it is dangerous, but we're familiar with it, and that's how we get. You know, if we're familiar with it, then it's not as scary to us. The coronavirus, on the other hand, the difference is it is a new virus. There is no immunity in the population for it, and so that's our biggest concern. We really don't know what to expect from it. We do know that we are warning our elderly population to um, to uh, try to avoid being in big crowds. Uh, those people who are have compromised immune systems, long-term health care problems, we are also warning them, start taking a look at, is it necessary for me to go into a crowd of 200 people or more? Thus, you know, some of the reasons why churches are being canceled and, and those who can are offering services online. Okay, good. So let's go to our second question. Um, what is the current case count and how contagious is the coronavirus? And again, I'll first direct this to you, Sherry, and then anyone else can uh, jump in if they'd like to. Uh, I understand that, uh, again, the, the numbers have gone up even in the state of Texas. The last number I had was 39, but I heard this morning it's already changed. So could we? Could you speak to the numbers in uh, the state and um, county and Beaumont? I don't have the, the absolute number. Does... Um, Mm -hmm. We have about 51 cases in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. Now, that includes the people who were repatriated to Texas um, from a cruise ship. So some of those people had been exposed to the coronavirus and tested positive. And I'm not real sure how many of those people there are. But remember, there are 29 million people in Texas. So we're looking at 57 cases. That doesn't seem like a lot, but there's still a lot we don't know about the virus that we are learning. Uh, we do know that 80% of people who will get coronavirus, they will just experience a common cold and they probably won't seek medical treatment at all and they will, be, they will recover just fine. Again, it's our elderly population and those people living with compromised immune systems that we're mostly concerned about, just like with the flu. You know, and again, we understand these numbers are changing. And, and, but I understand that, that as far as transmission, that 1.5 to 3.5 uh, is the average number a person can infect other people. So one sick person can infect up to three people easily. 
And so we can understand how the numbers could mushroom and balloon overnight very quickly. And that's why uh, we're even taking the steps that we're taking now uh, in trying to mitigate this situation. It's uh, canceling church services and gatherings and so forth. It's, it's not so much for where we are right now. It's for where we could be if this thing gets out of hand. And so they're trying to mitigate the situation and contain it to where we don't overwhelm our healthcare system because if it got out of control, we wouldn't be able to address it in the manner that we'd like to. Also, I understand that the fatality rate is anywhere from 0.7 to 3.4% uh, percent of people who die. And, and that, that, that number's really squirrely. Uh, it's changing constantly. Can you talk a little bit that, about the percentage and, of people? And that that's, are... that's a wide range. So I think that that has probably been a national average. Uh -huh. um, I'm not real sure. I think the last time we, we attempted to do the Texas average, it was 0 0.029 of people who had uh, expired from the coronavirus uh, in Texas. So it, it's still very low. We we do know that um, it, those have been elderly people with compromised immune systems who have um, who, who who have expired. So, which is unfortunate, but um, the the percentage is very low. Yeah, I think the number that I had actually three and a half percent is is more of a a, a national number that they're looking at. And but I did read and heard that. One of the concerns we have with the coronavirus now is it's 10 times more lethal than the flu. Is that numbers you're seeing? I have not heard that. I mean, I, I've heard it, but I don't know that to be true. I don't know. Not if 80%, uh, you know, I'm trying to wrap my mind around it. If 80% of the people who get it will recover, I don't know that it's 10 times more lethal than the flu. So I don't have any scientific base. Well, and again, so, that's why we're here, fact and fiction. Exactly. And so, uh, and, and then I heard, as you mentioned, 80% are mild cases. Yes. And then only 4% uh, is critical. And again, I, that just shows the range. And in that 4%, as you mentioned, it's primarily 60, 65 and up with a compromised immune system, yes. a, a, a compromised immune system or yes. uh, some underlying health issue already. Exactly. And it can be younger people with compromised immune systems. So the compromised immune system component is a part of that, um, that fatality rate. One last question. Uh, what is the status on developing a vaccine? I'm, 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 I know you don't have an inside track on that, but I what information can you give us at all? Have you heard anything at all about how we're progressing with the vaccine? So I have heard anywhere from one year to two years. That's, that's what's being said now. Um, hopefully um, we can get something a little bit sooner than that, but because we don't have a vaccine, because we don't have treatment for it, this is why we're encouraging people to do the tried and true public health measures that we know have worked over years. Wash your hands. You can't wash your hands enough. No matter how many times a day you're washing your hands now, do it twice as many times as you're doing it with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Hand sanitizer is okay if you don't have access to soap and water. Hand sanitizer will work, but soap and water is preferable. Stay home if you sick. Like Pastor has said, one sick person can infect another one and a half to three people. And that could wipe, at the health department, that would wipe out, you know, we would have to look at closing some of the services that we offer. Clean surfaces. The antibacterial, antiviral sprays, uh, cleaners that are in the, the stores that we use on a regular basis, Lysol, Clorox, uh, the 409 spray, those are effective. They're CDC approved to clean surfaces. They, those um, solutions will kill the virus. We understand that the virus can last on surfaces for up to three hours, which is not a long period of time, but if someone comes along and touches a surface where someone has coughed or um, and, and then touch their face, their eyes, their mouth, their nose. Those are the, the areas where germs enter into the body. So we want everybody to just clean, use good hygiene, um, 
be prepared, be prepared. You know, we live in, in, in a hurricane area, so we should have things in our home to at least sustain us for a week. I'm not real sure about toilet paper, but we should have non-perishable foods that would last us for about a week at home, according to what your family needs are. Okay, our third question, and, and this is a great segue for me. Uh, how does the coronavirus spread? And Again, back to the Public Health Department, Sherry, and also to the Beaumont Emergency Management Coordinator, Tim Oknacek. You might have something in, in, in to, to interject here, but uh, how does the, the, the virus spread? And you mentioned, for example, it, it, it's, it stays alive on a hard service for three hours. See, again, fact and fiction. Let, let me give you some numbers that I have and tell me, because this is what I get off the news and, 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 and social media and the Internet, and maybe you can tell us what the, uh, the official uh, report is from the health department. But uh, we understand that it's, it's transmitted through uh, respiratory droplets, coughing and sneezing. Uh, I was told it could stay alive several hours, airborne, three days on hard surfaces. And then a uh, person that is contagious can be contagious up to 37 days. So can you get into fact and fiction there and maybe clear some of that up for us if you have that information? Yeah, so the, the information that we have, and it was just clarified for us last week by our state health department. Uh, we had initially heard that the droplets could um, stay alive on surfaces for up to nine hours. Um, that was clarified for us last week by the state. It's three hours. So uh, again, that's why hand washing is so important. That's why cleaning all surfaces are so important. At the health department, we have our whole staff involved in cleaning because our cleaning staff can't do it all. So we're all taking part in keeping our areas clean, keeping our workstations clean. Um, so the, the, the virus is transmitted person to person. So if you're in close quarters with someone and they're talking to you and um, it, it can be transmitted that way, you can breathe in the droplet. That's the six feet. That's the six feet different um, distance yeah. if we're going to uh, move to social distancing. We want to try to stay at least six feet away from, from persons if we get to that point. Again, we do not have any confirmed cases in Jefferson County at this point. Um, we're making some efforts now to put some things in place so that if we do get the first case, people will have been educated. Uh, we go to the next part of our plan. People will easily know what to do. We're already starting that process. So, so this is, this is a, a good effort for us to be able to get information out. Uh, Tim, could you talk to a little bit about just the city? I, I know that we're looking at uh, large events, you know, rather it's at Julie Rogers or the Civic Center or the Event Center or the State Fair. Uh, uh, we're talking about social distancing, and, and we're not sure how long this is going to last. And um, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm asking the question, I mean, and no one can answer this, or, you know, rather we're going to be do, uh, engaged in this social distancing, rather it's 30, 60, 90 days, or the rest of this year. No one really knows that. We don't have a crystal ball. But why don't you talk a little bit about the city and some of the things you've been, you've been discussing and what we're looking at as far as the city is concerned and upcoming things and events. Okay, and I'll try to uh, defer medical questions to the medical director. However, uh, there's a lot of interaction, as she mentioned, even in something as simple as cleaning. You might have people that are, are established to clean your buildings, your facilities, even your home, but it takes everybody working together on this case because it needs to be done more routinely. And this is something that's not necessarily specific to coronavirus. It should be common in the flu season. This is the flu season. Uh, you've heard uh, people talking about mid-April, whatever. Well, the flu seasons, are they fluctuate. So, And I'll let uh, Ms. Sherry talk about stuff like that, but bottom line is what we want to do is we want to reduce the spread by taking some preemptive measures, as you've seen, a little more aggressive approach than maybe normal for flu season in this case, which uh, limiting the groups, the crowds, uh, and increasing the um, outreach 
and the uh, encouragement of people to take these precautionary measures, which are always in place during flu season. Um, the, the social distancing part that we're talking about, you know, you can, it doesn't matter if you have a huge group or if you have a, a small conference, but you could easily spread out a little bit. Um, there, there's a lot of things that we can do just day to day. We're looking at our plans for the city. We're working with the other agencies in the area and uh, coordinating this through not only the Department of State Health Services, but also the CDC. So you would say then to, to those that are watching that the city is, there's a partnership that's taking place with all the agencies. And as a city, we are trying to get ahead of this because so many times people ask the question, well, what is the government doing? And, and so much of what the government does is behind closed doors and they don't always get to see that. But I know you've been in meetings, uh, being a pastor plus a city council member at large, I'm privy to some information. Uh, but I don't know that the citizens always understand how diligent and how hardworking even our local government is. And I know the mayor and, and uh, your department and all the departments of the city are working so hard to try to serve the citizens of Beaumont. And, and you, would, you would encourage people just to be patient as the city is desperately trying to get ahead of this. Exactly. And, and uh, the approach we're taking is, is proactive, but we're, we're trying not to be uh, over aggressive, as you mentioned several times in your uh, initial points is, um, you know, we're not trying to scare people and there's a lot of, of bad information out there. There's a lot of people that will take something that's sent to them on Facebook or on uh, that they hear in a text or whatever and they'll, they'll pass it out as, as fiction or, or they'll pass it out as fact. What I would encourage people to do is look at the official sources for information, whether that's the CDC website, the Department of State Health Services website, the Beaumont Emergency Management and Public Health, the city websites has a number of places where this information is available, as do almost every jurisdiction in this whole state. Um, the information's out there. If you're getting something that you're not sure of is right, instead of passing it off, um, look to the real source or, pass that to the real source, and instead of passing off uh, uh, information that may be wrong, just go look at it online. We're putting out the right information. It's, it's out there on social media, on the city websites. It's also in the, uh, the uh, websites you can get for the government agencies. So we would, be, we would encourage people to be patient and know that it is a fluid situation. It's changing constantly. Yes, sir. I know at the beginning of this week, we were uh, looking to do this panel uh, with a live audience. Uh, and there were those who questioned that, but then it came out, president, governor, and, and county judge, you know, saying, please don't gather in 200 or more. And we made the decision immediately, let's shut this down and go live streaming. But people just have to understand because it is fluid and it's changing day by day, they need to be patient with leaders as we're constantly trying to catch up and stay ahead but when they get on social media and people get into a lot of negativity and a lot of uh, alarmist and, and, and sensationalism and uh, attacking and criticizing leadership, whether it's federal, state, or local, that's not helping anyone. We need to pull together. This is a national crisis. This is a worldwide crisis. And, and this is a time for us to pull together and address these issues. So thank you, Tim. Uh, fourth question. I'm sorry, uh, Pastor. Can I just add please. one more thing? So in, according, uh, in addition to what Tim has said, we don't just work together when there is a problem. We have plans in place. We, we uh, developed a pandemic plan nine years ago for H1N1, and we exercise parts of these plans on an ongoing basis. So several times a year, we get together, we talk things out, we actually do some real life exercises. So we are as prepared as we can be with the information that we're getting. And of course it's fluid, but we are accustomed to working through these types of situations. That's good. Tim, anything else? Okay, fourth question. What demographic is most at risk and how long will the coronavirus be with us? And I would direct this to Sherry and then Tim again and anyone else, if you have anything you'd like to interject, please do so. But uh, talk a little bit, you mentioned it earlier, but why don't you go ahead and clarify again uh, that, that uh, high risk demographic and, and because so many questions, you know, and we're all concerned about our children. I'm a, I'm a father and a grandfather 
And so I have children in their 30s. I have grandchildren, you know, ranging from infant to nine. And so we're all asking the question, you know, who is at risk? So, so from what we understand at this point, like I said before, it's the elderly population, um, 60s and older, 65 and older, as well as those people living with compromised immune systems. From what we understand, it is very mild with children. The children who have, um, who have been diagnosed with coronavirus ages 19 and under, um, they they have done very well. They, they recover without any problems. So for our children, it sounds like God has smiled on us. Uh, it's our elderly population that we want to be sure understand that they are um, being very careful about going out, um, determining whether or not going into a big crowd is absolutely necessary. And if not, for your for your safety, um, it, you might not want to do that. So one of the things too, I know we're concerned about is people that have a compromised respiratory uh, system, a COPD, uh, a um, allergies, or, or uh, asthma is the word I'm looking for. Those are the ones that really need to be careful because this Absolutely. attacks the, the lungs primarily. Absolutely, yes, yes. Why don't we talk a little bit? Uh, as you're, you're talking about this uh, coronavirus and, and just, you know, how long will it be with us? Why don't we address the, what they call, you know, the flattening of that line? You know, uh, there's a graph they're going to put on the screen. You know, we're all concerned about this peak and then we're trying to mitigate this thing where it levels out because I think what people need to realize is that the coronavirus is going to be with us for some time. And you said it earlier that it could take up to two years to develop a vaccine. So this is not here today, gone tomorrow. I think people may think, well, we'll just hang on to the summer and it's going to be over. Like the flu season, you know, it ends and then we're all back to normal. This is not that. I know they're worried about this thing peaking, but they want to chop that off quickly and get it down and then keep that straight line where we can, by through mitigation, we can maintain this thing where it doesn't overwhelm the health uh, the healthcare system. But if it goes up and it stays up and it stays up, that's where we get into a problem, Correct. And, and, and it would definitely tax our healthcare system. So there would have to be alternative ways that we would uh, look at, which some of those ways are in our plans, but we would have to look at alternative ways of, of caring for people. Um, again, a lot of people do not have to be hospitalized. They can recuperate at home. Um, some people will need to be hospitalized. Some people will need... Um, assistance with breathing, not uh, being ventilated. Um, so we, we just really have to wait and see what that's going to look out, look like. We know the capacity of our, of our healthcare system and we know at what point it's, we've, just, we've been maxed out, which is why we are encouraging people um, to call their healthcare providers or call the emergency rooms before going in. If you feel that you are having symptoms of coronavirus, difficulty breathing, don't just show up. Um, first of all, it, it just, it, it, it's, it, it just makes everybody uncomfortable. But if we know that you're coming, then the staff can prepare for you. They can meet you outside the door. They can hand you a mask. At the hospitals, they can get you immediately into an isolation room so that germ is contained, um, that virus is contained. So um, that's one way now we're trying to alleviate the, the workload on the healthcare system is to try to plan as best we can that people are going to be expected to coming in with uh, complaints of some difficulty breathing and some thoughts of, of having coronavirus. Again, a lot of times if we test them for the flu, they're positive for the flu, which is good, which is a good thing. But um, I also want to give a plug, it's not too late to get your flu shot. <laughs> well, again, I just want to uh, you know, repeat that the measures that are being taken now, like the declaration, uh, the, the state of emergency, uh, is not for where we are. Right now, it's manageable in the state of Texas and in the nation. It is manageable. But if this thing gets out and, and we lose control of it, it could reach a point where we could no longer manage this and it would overwhelm 
our health care system. So this is preventative. And that's what people don't understand because I hear people saying all the time, you guys are overreacting. And they don't understand that this is preventative to keep it, uh, to keep it under control because if we ever lose control, then, then we're going to have a serious problem. Right. I, I would like to make just one point of clarification. When we talk about overwhelming the system, the system's built, I'll call it a tiered type system. It might overwhelm the normal health system, but we do have plans in place for cases where the normal system is overwhelmed, which we do not want to have to initiate those or activate those plans. If we do this, we're mitigating, as you've mentioned, at an early stage, and the current normal day-to-day -day health system can accommodate that, and that's where we want to stay. We want to stay in that tier of, of service. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, fifth question, uh, how do we prepare, protect our families and ourselves? And again, back to Sherry and Tim. Okay, so I, I think we've probably addressed some of those things already um, as far as um, following the, some of the mandates that are being put in place now. Uh, I know that statewide, there have been schools that have been canceled. Um, so we just need for people to listen for accurate news, not for things that you see on Facebook. If it's on Facebook, it's, it's, not, it's not accurate. So what, what we are having to do a lot of times is chase down a lot of rumors on Facebook um, because they're not true, but people believe them and they start sharing that information. And we, again, a part of our job is, of course, to mitigate the disease, but it's also to address the rumors. And that takes a lot of time. So uh, do not listen to, do, do not use Facebook as your authoritative, authoritative um, means of getting information. Again, Practice those, those things that we have talked about, washing your hands, cleaning surfaces, um, stay home if you're sick, see your medical provider as soon as you think you need to see someone. Don't just stay home and suffer. See your medical provider as soon as you think you need to, so only you can determine that or you can give us a call. But listen to the directions of, from the city. Um, again, like Tim said, we have, we have um, websites. That's where you will get accurate information. We will use the media to get out accurate information, but it will come from a city official. So listen, listen to the official voices and try not to listen to social media. One point I'd like to make up is, is when we're talking about Facebook, there's a lot of people putting information on Facebook, but most of the government agencies also have Facebook, Twitter, and those kind of things. The use of those social media as sources would be proper and appropriate. We are putting the information out, the same information that goes on the website goes out on social media. Uh, and likewise, so you should be able to use a city official or a government official source, whether it's social media or website, as an official source of information. It's the it's the person-to-person -person transfer of the information we want to try to uh, limit. Good. Well, I think the point is too is that we want to encourage people if they are in that high-risk demographic, they need to to pay attention and and be very cautious. But outside of that, people need to keep living and they need to weigh risk uh, versus benefit. Uh, is it worth it? And they just, but we can't shut down as a society. If you're not in that high risk demographic, we need to, uh, we need to keep, keep living. Uh, I'm assuming we all agree that you don't need at this point to stockpile groceries and supplies. And we got people, as you mentioned, buying tons of toilet paper. And I don't know why that one item seems to be the focus, but I mean, we, 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 we I, you know, maybe you should invest and toilet paper stock, I don't know, but that, that seems to be where we're headed. So, but uh, uh, I think we all agree we don't need to do that. Before we transition out of this segment, I've been primarily talking to Sherry and Tim, uh, before we segue out of that, uh, we do have some Facebook uh, questions, and so we're going to take a few of those before we get into BISD and Dr. Mensa. 
Yes, we have a few questions from Facebook. One of them is, is it true that you can carry this virus um, in an incubation stage for weeks without knowing that it's in your body and spread the virus without visible signs of the virus? Jennifer asked this question. You know, we have, we have heard that, but the clarification that we have gotten from the state is that once there is a contact with the virus, it will take two to 14 days for the symptoms to appear. So, so far, that's the last information that we have, but we did initially hear that information about the, you know, from the question, um, but it's been clarified for us. So, again, that's today. It may change. Christy. Um, Anthony asked, once you get the virus, if you get the virus, can you get it again? We don't know. That's, that's been a question that's been asked before, and we, there's no answer. Um, Jessica asked if this virus is just like the flu in that it spreads like viruses do, airborne. I'm not understanding the panic and the closures of so many things. What is it about this virus that would want to close schools, churches, etc., but we don't do that for the flu? So again, I think it's because it's a new virus. There is no human immunity in the population. Uh, with flu, we do have immunity to flu. Uh, there is a flu vaccine. For this virus, there is not yet any treatment. So that's the concern. Another question was, are there any updates on domestic travel? Yes, I think there are, and those are listed on our website. Um, if you go to Texas Department of State Health Services, there are travel warnings. And then the last question in this segment, is it real, Memphis asks, is it realistic to expect the, po uh, is it realistic to expect the possibility of the government isolating us to our homes only and shut down any movement? Is that realistic? I don't know that it's realistic at this point. I do know it is a part of a big plan. I think that we're, your point is we are speculating at this point, but we do have concerns because we look at Italy and what they've done. We look at Spain and France now that has followed their, their example and they're shutting those nations down. And again, I think that's part of why we're doing this today is to mitigate the situation where we don't have to do that. We're trying to get ahead of this thing and prevent it from getting to the point where we would have to shut down our borders and shut down our businesses. Yeah, it, Italy is a good example. I think that um, there were just things that were put in place a little late and it got ahead of them. And so that's why um, it, it, when the county issued the declaration, then we're doing... Um, some of the social distancing things that we're putting in place now. Our goal is to prevent the spread of this infection, and that's what public health does, not only with this disease, but so many other diseases. Okay, let's transition now, and let's talk about this outbreak and, and how this could impact uh, our school system and also our, our families here in Beaumont. Uh, again, these numbers are fluid, we know that. But uh, the last number I got was 46,000 school closures national, impacting 26 million students. So our sixth question out of eight is, what plans, protocol does BISD have in place if there is an outbreak in Beaumont? So this first goes to our assistant superintendent, Dr. Anita Frank. Let me begin by saying that the, safe and, uh, the safety and the health of our students is various paramount to us. Also, our families and our community. We have an emergency management response team that has been activated, and we have some precautionary measures that are already in place that we're doing on campuses. We were doing this because it is flu season already. We work very closely with our uh, public health department, so we've been cleaning surfaces, doorknobs, of course, desks. Uh, we've been going through and making sure that we clean water fountains. Also, because of our issues with coronavirus, we have a new machine that we're using, our electrostatic machine, that is 
deep cleaning our campuses. We are off this week because of spring break, and every campus in our district will be deep cleaned by this new machine that we have uh, purchased for the district. Also, not only do we have precautionary measures, our emergency management team has been looking at the what ifs. You did state there are several school districts that have decided that they are not having classes. We want to make sure in the event that we have to close classes, that we are able to communicate with our parents, that we are able to provide or educate our students, and then provide additional resources that students get at school, such as feeding and feeding our students. So our team has been working. We have met. We will continue to meet. It's spring break for our students, but guess what? We're meeting to make sure that we can meet the needs of our students and of our families. I do want to say that right now, BISD does intend on returning from spring break. I recommend that our families stay connected through our website. We mentioned earlier, we have a lot of things that are going on on social media. Please make sure that you look at our website, www.bmtisd.com. We will push out communications there so that families know exactly what we are doing and how, that, uh, how they need to proceed. But for right now, we do have plans in place to make sure that we can communicate with our families. Also, with educating our students, we are looking at ways that we can do this online, also where parents may be able to pick up packets, and then also looking at how we can feed our students as well. You know, Dr. Frank, I think, um, I'm not sure that people understand how convoluted situations like this can get, but uh, if, uh, if, if, if I understand correctly, and, and it's good to have Joshua Cavett. He just joined us, and uh, we appreciate you. Joshua was at his church. Uh, they were doing a service live streaming, and so he's, do, he's doing double duty today. So we welcome you to the panel, and uh, we appreciate you giving us this time. But, Dr. Frank, it's not just a simple thing of, well, why don't we just cancel school? Uh, because not only are we concerned about the education of our students, but some of our students, as you mentioned, if they don't come to school and, and eat lunch, they don't get to eat that day. I mean, there's, there's a deficiency there. There are issues there about meals and food. And, and also we have working parents that if they don't have school, then they're, they're confronted with child care. And, and I'm assuming in some cases students would have to stay home alone. And so this kind of just mushrooms for us and creates a lot of problems. All of those are issues that we consider. The school system does, we educate our students. Students have a safe place to be when, when their parents are at work, and they do have food to eat. Breakfast and lunch is provided free to all of our students. So if we were to close school, that would be, a, it's a very hard decision, knowing that we would have some students who would be in a situation where they may not have food at home, uh, we would have parents, just like you said, that may not be able to go to work where they can provide for their families. We are going to do what is best. We are working with our uh, Beaumont Public Health Department, our city officials. Uh, our superintendent is in conversations daily with our commissioner of education. We will do what is best and what is right to keep our students and families healthy. But at the same time, I do want to assure you that we will have a plan to take care of our students in the event that we have to close campuses. I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. Uh, and you may not be able to answer this at this time, and if you can, I understand. But is there a trigger and or triggers that would cause the closure of the school district? Have you, have you discussed that? Just like I mentioned earlier, we're working very closely with our Bowman uh, Public Health Department, city officials. We will make the decision based on guidance that we receive. So it will not be an easy decision for us, but working with our uh, city officials and the Beaumont Public Health Department, we will take that guidance and make the very best decision for our students. Okay, I think we have some Facebook que questions, so back to Christy. Yes, I want to make sure I get to them. Any insight or advice for small business owners of Jefferson County? <laughs> you 
You know, uh, I, I'm not qualified to speak to this. I don't know, Joshua, you have any information, but it's my understanding that the government is working now to try to uh, provide help for us uh, with that issue. But, I mean, do you have anything uh, that you can speak to at this point? Uh, Tim? I'm not totally clear I understand the question. Are we talking about uh, economic issues like the inability to, because you lost your, your revenue from something closing? Is that what we're talking about? I believe so. The question from Memphis is directly from her. Any insight or advice for small business owners for Jefferson County? I believe that's what she's Well, saying. It, we did put something on our website um, Friday, I think, which is uh, it's on the city of Beaumont dot gov website on the emergency management page and there's some documents on there that you can fill out and there's an email address to submit them to the emergency management office and we'll collect those but basically the state is in uh, trying to coordinate with us right now in order to get the um, to get an SBA declaration and if the uh, small business administration declarations out that would provide relief to uh, pro businesses and nonprofits that are um, that lost or had economic issues during this, and I think it's called an economic injury form. But it is posted on the website along with an address they can uh, email address they can send it to. Yeah, let me just read this for you, Tim. This is the press release by the mayor, and I know Tim, you actually were part of this. Uh, uh, by going to the emergency management section of our city website and submitting an economic injury worksheet. Uh, and guys, put that on, on the uh, screen if you would. I provided it. I hope you have that. Is it uh, eoc.beaumont, eom at beaumonttexas.gov? OEM. EOM? Beaumont OEM, Office OEM. of Emergency yeah, Management. Yeah, the printing on here is very I'm small. Uh, Tim, go ahead and give it again so that we're clear. eoc.beaumontoem at beaumonttexas.gov. Okay. I can get it to them later if, if I need to. And we need as many businesses as will to fill that form out, correct? Well, I think it's in their best interest, and it's in the state's interest to make sure that we have documented the economic injury from this coronavirus incident. Okay. Christy? Another business-related question from Haley. Do businesses need to continue on as normal? Okay. Right now, the uh, order from the uh, chief elected officials impacts a uh, large gathering. There's an urgent or a uh, recommendation for businesses with large populations that, um, that they limit their um, attendance or gatherings in line with the public facilities. And I think it's number three on the judge, on Judge Brannick's order. Uh, that can be accessed by um, going to the Jefferson County webpage, um, and that would impact pretty much everyone, but it is a recommendation to the businesses where it's an order for uh, public facilities throughout the county. Okay. Anyone else before I, before I shift? Okay. Um, number seven. Uh, what emotional and psychological impact could this crisis have on people? Um, and, of course, we're all concerned about our children and our teenagers. And I'll first go to Beaumont Psychiatric Clinic, Dr. Jason Mensa. It's naturally to be worried during this time. We're in, uncertain situ in an uncertain situation. Um, but like children, are very psychologically real, resilient and very psychologically flexible. So things that I recommend when managing information to children is to limit their exposure to media, maybe watching something from the news one to two times a day, and then informing them, right now we're in a state of prevention. You know, there is currently no cases here in Jefferson County um, and, and keeping them informed with that. The next thing is... Uh, doctor, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you, but I, I, this is so critical what you're saying. I want to make sure we're tracking with you. So what you're recommending to parents 
is I understand limit their exposure to the information, but to be honest with them, tell them the truth, but let them know exactly where we are in that preventative stage and it's not a complete outbreak. But you're saying don't hide it from them, be honest with them and be truthful. Yes. Okay. That's good. You know, uh, children, they have wild imaginations. Um, they may say, oh, the coronavirus is the zombie uh, apocalypse. No, that's not <laughs> what's happening here. And they're going to hear this rather they hear it from us or from friends at school, correct? Yes. So th it's better they hear it from us instead of getting their information off of social media. Exactly. Um, and just making sure while they're off from school that they have a uh, routine, arts and crafts, learning projects. Um, recently, I played a game with my son, Pokemon card game, uh, because I was off from work due to this uh, epidemic that we're uh, facing. But just spending time with your children, enjoying the time that you do have off from work, connecting. So That's you're talking you about taking this bad situation and turn it to our good and reconnecting with family and friends uh, where possible and, yes. and just making sure that we keep community because we're talking about social distancing. Uh, so we, somehow we've got to have, still have community and relationship building even in the midst of this crisis then. Yeah, exactly. So with the social distancing, maybe we may not hug more, but um, maybe one of the things we can do is... Um, there's this thing in yoga called namaste in which we put our hands together over our chest and we bow, which means the divinity within me acknowledges the divinity within you. So even though we do have social distancing, it's important to still be socially connected with one another. Uh, let me talk to you, doctor. Uh, there are some things I've read about uh, helpful tools for coping with situations like this. And just tell me your opinion on these items. Uh, you may tell me good, bad, or ugly, but uh, I've, here's just four things that I read we can do as a community. One is self-care. We need to eat right, sleep, exercise, and maintain a normal routine where possible. And uh, I, I would say that this would be a great opportunity for all of us to do a health check and realize that we need to stay healthy so that when we're... Uh, hit with a crisis like this that we're physically able to withstand. Our immune system is up. Uh, we're healthy and strong because we have some type of a daily routine where we're eating right, sleeping right, exercising. We need to get our health up. This is a, this is a real gut check for us to make sure that we're healthy so we can withstand these type of things. So number one, self-care. Number two, emotional health. Patience with the situation. Talk with family and friends. Counseling if needed. Uh, religion. Uh, attending church, whatever that is for you, and making sure that you're, you're connected to God and, and that you're, you've got that spiritual connection. Uh, limit media exposure, as you just mentioned. And then the fourth one I was interested in, focusing on others, making sure that we are uh, staying connected and attentive to the needs of other people, finding a way to help others and not just be so self-absorbed and isolated where we're just like uh, trying to survive the apocalypse, as you said, but let's make sure that we're still reaching out. Typically, when people suffer from symptoms of anxiety and depression, that's usually a lot of being self-focused. Um, you're only in tune with your anxiety. You're only in tune with your depression. But when we flip it on the inside out, we ask ourselves, what's going on with our neighbors? and how can we help them? Uh, one good thing we need to do is check in on our elderly population. Um, and hopefully we could utilize things like Skype or different type of social media to check on our relatives that may be in nursing homes because they're over 65, they could be immunocompromised, but they need to know that we care. So we have to stay connected. We have to. Let me ask you this question. Uh, is it possible people will experience post-traumatic stress reactions or have these reactions like PTSD with the coronavirus outbreak as they have with other crises like a hurricane or a flood? Or is it possible people will have this post-traumatic uh, syndrome? Possible, yes. Particularly people that have been quarantined. So far, nobody in Jefferson County, as I know, ha we haven't been quarantined but particularly those people. Um, and with being quarantined, there's also people that struggle with feelings of guilt. Like, oh my gosh, you know, I have this sickness and I may have gotten other people sick. Or, oh wow, good point. 
or um, dealing with um, what I'm going to do. You know, I've been off work for a month and how am, am I going to support my family? So these are real worries and concerns that people, particularly that have been quarantined, are going to have. Yes, wow. Let's go to Christy because I believe we have a Facebook question. We do actually um, a few of them. Tiffany asked, can the virus be transferred through packages, through the mail? Uh, we, have, we have read that no, they cannot. Jessica is asking, what will our health department and government need to see for things to go back to, quote, normal? Can these things go away like the flu so once you stop seeing positive cases, you can resume normal activity? Yeah, that's absolutely what we're going to be looking at. Um, you know, we, we're preparing now to attempt to mitigate the spread of, of this virus. Um, so if we get to a point where we have cases, then we need to, before we can get back to normal, we need to get to a point where the virus is, is, is not circulating in our community or there is a vaccine available that we can administer. Josemary asks, this is a question for Jason. Any tips for helping when people are anxious? I see two sides. Some people almost laugh at what's happening and how the world is responding. Others are saying it is apop apocalyptic. Can you give some phrases or communication tips to help us be empathetic and not increase anxiety? Wow, that's a very, very good question. Um, and first, you know, we have to recognize that anxiety is normal, but what's not normal is um, anxiety moving to fear, fear moving to paranoia. So with, the, the, with anxiety, we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do about it? So some things that we could do is to start planning. Um, making plans for if you have young children. I have young children, so I'm thinking, what projects can we do at home? What arts and crafts can we do at home? Um, what do I need in my cupboards? What do I need in, in my freezer? Um, and do I have toilet tissue? Well, maybe not the toilet <laughs> tissue one, but, <laughs> but things like that. Also, uh, daily exercise, and particularly um, getting into the word. Uh, spending some quiet time for Bible study and meditation. Those are some things that I think can help with um, anxiety. You know, doctor, one of the things I'm concerned about as a pastor is that Southeast Texas had just come through Harvey and the Imelda. And so we were already emotionally and psychologically compromised. And then you pile on top of that this, uh, concerned. And I think this is a time when we need, as leaders, pay attention to people because if this continues, uh, this could really become a problem for some people. And we just don't want to see people get into despair, as you mentioned, where they start giving up. Because this has been a tough time for Southeast Texas. It, it, it has. But one thing, I, I'm new to Southeast Texas. I've been here about seven years. And the people of Southeast Texas are extremely resilient, are really connected with one another. Um, and it's incredible. Everybody kind of knows one another, is connected, and is willing to reach out to help their neighbor. Um, and I really, I could be naive, but I really do not see the people of this community going into despair. I see people in this community going and reaching out and helping their neighbors. Good. Good. Let's go to our eighth and final question. What steps should we take to prepare for the economic impact caused by the coronavirus? And I'll, I'll pitch this one to Raymond James Financial Advisor Joshua Cabot. Sure. If you could bring up the slide that has the crisis and events where it has multiple events, that'd be fantastic. Um, once that's up, keep going. Uh, a couple more. All right here. So one, one more back. So on this slide right here, difficult to see, um, hopefully on the, the, the replay, we were able to be able to zoom into this. This shows a crisis and events that's happened multiple years and it comes up every year. There's many different um, viruses that have gone around. 
lots of other events uh, that are just very concerning. Uh, and I would say previous events are not as socially spread and people continue to garner that fear. Um, so, I mean, if, if, you know, one question, the previous question was, you know, apocalyptic, if, if that were to happen, I mean, there's nothing we would be able to do. Um, so I can guarantee that there will be future events like this, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't exercise caution in, in, in being careful of, of the spread to reduce that. Um, so economic wise, I think um, there's gonna be, I can tell you exactly what's gonna happen with the equity markets this year. It's gonna go up and it's gonna go down. And there's gonna be times when it's not fun and it's gonna be times when it's, you know, people get euphoric. Uh, if we think back to a time like 2008 uh, or, or March of 2009 when you hit a bottom uh, in the equity markets, uh, that was clearly a bottom and I would, I, would, I would guarantee that everyone felt pretty terrible at that time on investing. Uh, so from an economic standpoint to, to capture on that, uh, that would have been the best time to invest. Everyone knows buy low, sell high, right? So whenever, it's, it's almost counterintuitive in that you want to be able to, to be advantageous whenever people are, are in Warren Buffett quote to say, you know, be greedy when others are fearful uh, and be fearful when others are greedy. So when you have market tops, um, like we had a few weeks ago, uh, or, or just a little bit more, um, and, and I, I, I have my dentist giving me a stock tip and saying, oh, you gotta buy this. That's a time when I see euphoria in, in clients uh, and they get greedy. And that is a time when we all need to, to be careful um, about portfolios, which I could talk a lot about diversification, uh, not just in equity markets, in many different asset classes, uh, is extremely important during these times rather than being very concentrated in certain equity uh, exposures. Uh, isn't it true that um, it is dangerous to take a single snapshot of the stock market and make a decision? You have to look at the stock market over the history of America, and, and over the long haul, it has been healthy. Is that correct? Absolutely. So if you can go to uh, the slide, it was, it was three after uh, where it shows market tops and bottoms. I can speak on that. Uh, one more. That's a great slide, but I'm going to go back. So this one right here, this one goes back to uh, 1996, and you can see uh, you had a P.E. ratios at that time that were pretty low. Market goes up to a tech bubble, goes down uh, to, um, uh, which is uh, in 2002 at the bottom there. Market goes up until 2007, comes down significantly at March of 2009, and goes up all the way up until the current date. And I always say, if you give my uh, five-year-old a crayon on this, you can ask her which direction she thinks it's going to go, and she's obviously, go obviously going to say it's going to go down, right? And so uh, if you could go to one more slide after that, and uh, this show goes all the way back to 1900, and I, I, I can see a pretty clear um, trend here. So if you start at the very beginning, you see a sideways transitioning. You have a breakout to the upside. That one period of 1929 and the Great Depression, I would say is the one caveat there, but then you have a breakout to the upside, a sideways transitioning, a breakout to the upside, a sideways transitioning, a breakout to the upside, a sideways transitioning. And so looking at over a period of time, equity markets and fixed income markets have been a good investment. Doesn't mean that it can't get cheaper than what it is right now, um, but it is extremely important to look over a period of time rather than a very short period of time. Um, and is it, is it true that, you know, I mean, here just recently, I think it reached 29, is that correct on the number? And then it dropped down, but we're still over 20 on the stock market, and that's still a good number. I mean, I, I, in my lifetime, I wasn't sure we'd ever see that. But I think we have to keep it in perspective that the stock market is still at a very high number. Is that correct? It is a high, high number. It doesn't mean that it can't go lower. But I think if, if we shut the media off and we, we looked at our statements a few years from now, we look back and, we, and, and don't look at those statements the, the entire period of time. It's not to say don't be prudent in looking at them, but don't focus on those. So if, you, if we were to look back, I would, I would 
it would be very probable that we would have a higher equity market over time. And again, it doesn't mean that it can't get cheaper. Um, I had a, a friend ask me recently, you know, why, why should I not put a ton of money into ExxonMobil stock? Which is a great question because it has fallen a lot. And, and my answer to that is that's a, it's a great question. It probably will be a good investment, but that doesn't mean that it can't go cheaper in, in, the, in the short term. There's many different sectors, um, consumer staples, you know, consumer discretionary. Consumer staples obviously are, are probably doing better than other sectors just with toilet paper, toothpaste, et cetera. Uh, but there's many different sectors uh, that you can have amazing diversification through and have immediate liquidity. So if you need to sell one of those things is ex extremely valuable. I think that's something we, we take for granted in the United States um, is many asset classes like real estate, it's hard to be able to go out and sell those right away. Whereas the United States amazingly has a very uh, uh, liquid market to where you can sell. Now the valuation may change very quickly at times, um, but, but that's, that's something I think we should all appreciate. Joshua, would you agree with the statement that um, now we're talking about balance again, I, I, I recognize that, but do you agree that uh, at, at, th at this time, right now, the greatest threat to the American economy is an overreaction to the coronavirus? Stock market. The greatest, you said the greatest well, risk. Well, we, we'll take that, maybe that's a little strong, but do you feel like an overreaction to the, to, the, to the coronavirus at this time could have a negative impact on the stock market? People need to calm down when, in regards to the economics. Sure, it, it could have a negative impact. It could have an extremely positive impact. Like, if we're, if we're talking about two completely separate things, one, the, the health aspect in the nation, obviously that's not beneficial, but could it be an opportune time to invest? Just like, it, had you bought it, um, you know, on Friday morning it was down, or it was, it was high, went very low, so can you take advantage? And you had mark, equity markets almost up 2,000 points on the Dow. There are opportunities to be able to invest in, um, and but the the overall impact of the coronavirus. I think that there's a an, an overreaction, um, and there there will be overreactions in other areas. But that creates opportunity. Good. Okay. Well, listen. I I I really have enjoyed this. I hope you have. I believe it's been beneficial to the people of Southeast Texas. But I'd like to close out with what we call bottom line. I uh, want to give each of you an opportunity just to recap and maybe put into one sentence how, where, where, uh, how you feel where we are at this moment, and I'll begin with Sherry. So I feel that um, we are at a moment of um, really working together with our partners. We always work together. Uh, we're working together a little bit more closely now. And I think that the citizens of Beaumont can trust that the leaders of the city will make the best decisions possible regarding this new virus that's in the human population. Tim. I just want to encourage everybody, the, the actions, some of them seem overreactive or maybe aggressive, but to some extent, I think it's obvious from, to everybody that that's what's kept the numbers down, the, the health impacts down in this country and in this state. So I would encourage you to, to do everything you can to help. There's a lot of maybe unnecessary meetings or maybe uh, things like you've done as, as the pastor of this church and say, well, let's just uh, have a remote meeting. Um, we can still keep the communication, as the doctor uh, says, going, but yet there's some safer ways to do business. Keep, keep clean, take, take care of yourself, uh, and stay healthy, and we'll get over this a lot quicker than we will if everybody just goes about as business as usual. Thank you. Anita? I would ask that our parents to uh, stay connected through our website and our social media sites. We do plan on attending school on the 23rd, but if that changes, we will push that information out. Also, take the time to visit with your students and talk to them about the importance of hand washing. We've heard that from, our, uh, from Ms. Ulmer also. And I encourage parents, when we return to school, and this is a little different because we normally are encouraging you know, attendance. If your child is sick, 
please keep them at home. Good point. Jason. Um, anxiety is natural during this time. This is a very uncertain situation. But let's not let that anxiety freeze us into fear, paranoia, and doing nothingness. Let us use this anxiety to mobilize, to make sure that we have the things that our family and our community needs. And also, let's think about the needs of others and have some type of spiritual meditation practice to help decrease the anxiety and look for opportunities to be to service of others. Thank you, Joshua. Say on, on a few different aspects. One on the medical, uh, Raymond James hired, uh, his, his name is Chris Meeker. Uh, he was at the, the CDC, has been giving us updates periodically, and um, it's, it's very simple. Like, like they said, wash your hands, sing happy birthday for 20, uh, two times, which basically 20 seconds, uh, and minimize contact. Um, so on, on medical-wise, I think we can all exercise prudence uh, in being careful. I think that is it's opening up a broader, um, more digital uh, environment than we have had in the past because things are becoming a lot more digitized and it's very interesting to see how that is evolving because we had nowhere near this um, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, I would say um, from a financial perspective, uh, just be diversified, think long-term rather than thinking short-term. Uh, if, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, uh, to, to send me an email. I'm happy to be able to, uh, to respond to those. Uh, and then lastly, I would say from a, a, a biblical perspective, uh, since we're at church, I'm assuming that's okay to be able to discuss. Right. Um, uh, I mean, God, God is in control. And if we, if we doubt that, um, we say, oh, what's going on? He's not in control of things. Um, he's omniscient. He knows all things. Um, and I think uh, we, we, it's, it's great as a country that we can stop uh, and, and, and as fast as we did and take precautionary measures to hopefully reduce the spread of that virus. I think once uh, we have additional testing measures available, uh, the denominator of the actual number of people will increase significantly, which will lower the percentage of, of, uh, of the mortality rate. Um, uh, I, from the statistics that I've done, uh, 32, 327 million people in the United States, 32 million approximately every year, 10%, you have a 0.1% mortality rate, which is roughly 25 to 30,000 people. Uh, on the, the coronavirus, it seems more right now in the United States, if you take it, it's over one. But I think that over time, it looks like it's going to be 10 times deadlier than, uh, than uh, the, 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 the flu. And so I think uh, the more testing that's going to come available and the, more, the higher denominator, the more that's going to ease people's fears. Um, but again, I think in a, in a biblical perspective to say, you know, God has us under control. It's not the first time that things like this have happened. It's the first time that we've been more socially aware of that. Well, again, thank you so much for participating uh, on this panel. Um, if you're able to stay for a few more minutes after the service, I'm sure there may be some here today that have questions for you, and I would encourage you to stay and answer those questions if possible. If you have to slip out because you have family plans, we do understand. But again, thank you so much. You've been a huge blessing to our community, and I'll dismiss you at this time. Thank you for serving. We appreciate you.